So this week is Parshas Chaye Sarah, and it's it's a really interesting development in the story of Genesis. Last week, we read about Abraham and Abraham's kindness and his intercession on behalf of Sodom and the birth of Isaac and the banishment of Ishmael, and finally the binding of Isaac. After Isaac was almost sacrificed, Sarah died. Talmud tells us that someone came to Sarah and said, oh, Abraham tried to sacrifice Isaac, and she collapsed and died. Instead of starting it off by saying, uh, Isaac is all right, he's fine, but Abraham tried to kill him, they flipped it around, and therefore Sarah dies. And the parsha begins with Abraham trying to find a burial location for Sarah, and he has to negotiate with the very cunning Ephron. But the bulk of the parsha deals with the first courtship in the Torah, where Abraham is looking for a spouse for his son Isaac, and he has very uh, rigid specifications of what he's looking for. And he doesn't want someone from the Canaanites, where he's currently living. He wants to go back east to his homeland to find a wife from his family for Isaac. And he doesn't go himself, and he doesn't send Isaac himself. And he makes it very clear, Isaac is not allowed to leave Israel. Never, Isaac never left Israel in his life. And even later on, Isaac is going to want to leave, and God's going to tell him, no, you have to stay in Israel. So if Isaac needs a spouse from outside of Israel, and Isaac is not allowed to go there himself, the, uh, Abraham appoints his servant, whose name is Eliezer, to go and find a spouse for Isaac. And there's a whole set of conditions that Abraham institutes. Can't find a Canaanite. You have to go to that location. And Elias is like, oh, well, what if, you know, he's trying to figure out, well, what if she doesn't want to come with me? Well, if she doesn't want to come with me, you don't worry about it. You just do your job and let the Almighty worry about everything else. He takes 10 camels laden with all the wealth of his master. So Abraham was very wealthy and all the wealth was taken with him. And they set out east and they travel and they arrive uh, to uh, to the town, and then it's really interesting set of uh, uh, the narrative is really interesting because Eliezer he makes this prayer, and he tells God, "Okay, I'm looking for a spouse for Isaac, but I don't know. There's a million women here. What am I supposed to do?" So he starts praying, and he tells God, "Okay, I'm going to make a test, and I'm going to employ the test." And whoever passes the test, they're a good candidate. What's the test? I'm going to ask the girl for water, and she's going to give water not only to me, but to the camels. So I think there's a few interesting questions here. First of all, I think we could arguably say that the most important decision someone's going to make in their lives is who they're going to marry. Uh, Certainly, Isaac, who's here, we're building the Jewish nation. It's very important who this person is. And, you know, you wouldn't want someone else to pick out the color of the tile in your kitchen or buy a car for you or buy a house for you, certainly. Yet somehow the Torah is seemingly advocating the fact that Eliezer, someone else, is going to pick out a spouse for Isaac. Seems kind of strange. You know, the why would you offload this very important mission to an emissary? Now, to be clear, they didn't actually get married until they met. But still, Eliezer is selecting the most prime candidate and not Isaac. It seems interesting. Uh, Additionally, there's this test that Eliezer devises. I'm going to ask the girl for water. She'll give me water. But she'll say, oh, I'm going to give your camels water as well. And that request, it wasn't like Eliezer said, give me and my camel's water. He just asked for water for himself. And the unstated needs of Eliezer, namely the needs to feed, to water his camels, that specifically is indicative of her suitability for Isaac. Now Rashi tells us that a, a woman, a girl who recognizes that the camels need water as well, she obviously has the characteristic of chesed, the attribute of kindness, and that makes her worthy to be in the empire of kindness 
of Abraham. We saw last week, Abraham, that's what he did. He did kindness. And therefore, if the girl, which turned to be Rebecca, if she exhibits this characteristic as well, that shows that she's worthy of joining this family. But the question is, like, kindness, we think of kindness as someone doing doing good, being benevolent, helping others. Why specifically does that uh, – is that reflected only in the person fulfilling the unstated needs of the recipient? That's one question. But also, you think about a spouse. Like, what, what does it mean to be a good spouse? Uh, what does it mean to have a harmonious relationship? What determines compatibility? So you say, well, kindness is, of course, a major part of it. But there's other things as well. And certainly, if we're talking about building the Jewish nation, there are uh, religious aspects. Abraham is a great innovator. He's alone on an island, the island of monotheism. And he's the innovator, and he's the one who's starting this new trend in history. And Rebecca, we know her family. They're a family of idolaters like everyone else is. Everyone's pagans. And Eliezer doesn't even investigate whether or not she has the same religious beliefs as Isaac and the family of Abraham. That's not even addressed. Who's to say that she is not like one of her family? And why is that not at all seemingly on the priority list of Eliezer? So a few questions here about the story. So I want to, I want to give like a, a little bit of an, of an insight in the courtship aspect, but also in the kindness aspect. So I think, firstly, to answer the first set of questions, I think, you know, not to go too far into it, but just to pull the core insight. When someone's looking for a spouse, and when someone's trying to find someone who's going to be with them in marriage, the success and failure is determined over the long-term horizon. You can't know until it's been years later to find out if a long-term proposition was successful or failure, or was a success or failure. So what this means, that whenever you're someone selecting a spouse, there's a lot of factors to determine suitability – but they have to be such, they have to be aligned and compatible in a way that's going to last for the long term. And perhaps what the Torah is telling us by the first, we don't know how Abraham and Sarah met, it doesn't tell us. Right? Uh, Noah and his wife, and his, we don't, we're not told those stories. This is the first time we're told about how a marriage was set up. And the Torah is telling us, Abraham sent Eliezer a thousand miles away to find a spouse for Isaac. Perhaps the idea is, is that what's really important in determining suitability for a spouse is character. And character, if someone is a good, effective judge of character, it's possible that they could be capable of determining suitability. Moreover, the individual themselves, they are much more likely to focus on the short-term characteristics and ignore or have a cloudiness of judgment with respect to the long term. So this is just an interesting idea that the Torah is telling us that it is possible, maybe even preferable, to have input from other people who don't have the same biases that we do when trying to determine suitability, compatibility of uh, of character, which is an interesting idea. But what does he examine? He looks at kindness. More specifically, he's looking at her intuition to notice and to recognize and to care for the needs of others when she was not told what they are. How do I know what you need unless I am told? That can only happen if I am already preordained to notice someone else and what they're going through. You know, we have feelings and the feelings of pain and pleasure are the most dominant and fixed emotions and senses that we have. And a very ch- child already at day one, they, 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 when there's pain, they cry and when there's pleasure, they smile. Like that, that's, that, that's the, the most basic lever of, of, of life and choices. What's going to bring me pleasure? What's going to, how am I going to avoid pain? 
but someone else's pain, I don't feel. You know, they said, uh, I don't remember who said it, but, uh, uh, s- well, <laughs> somebody, s- somebody said that you're more likely to be bothered about a pothole in front of your house than an earthquake in Myanmar. Even though the earthquake, in absolute terms, there's 100,000 people dead in Haiti. Yes, but I have a pothole that's, that's, that's ruining my tires, right? Why? Because we interact with the world through our prism. And our prism is our own pain and pleasure. And therefore, a minor pain is worse than no pain. And if I have no pain for someone else, but I have a minor pain for myself, well, that's more important to me. And we are wired, at least by default, that the pain of others doesn't register. Our pain does. Other people's pain does not. That is, I say by default, because that is how we start off life. That's what the Yetzar Hara does to us. The end goal is to actually create uniformity between the feelings of pain and pleasure that I have for myself and the pain and pleasure that I have for others. That is someone, we talk about a great person in the Torah parlance that refers to someone who has chipped away at this cocoon of selfishness that they begin their life with. Because this cocoon of selfishness that you, you that the eights are up places you in by default, that keeps you boxed in. And all you have is yourself, so to speak. All you have on a visceral, tangible, palpable level is yourself and nothing else. So your fellow man, or dare I say God, they're outsiders of your purview. And thus, the characteristic that causes us to not see the pain in others and the characteristic that causes us to ignore and to obviate God, it's actually at the core, it's the same thing. It's the Yetzir Hara. And thus, we look at Abraham. Abraham, we read last week how over the top he is with respect to kindness. Yet we know historically Abraham is unique because he introduces God into the world. And it seems kind of interesting, like what is Abraham? Is he the paragon of kindness or the paragon of faith? And the answer is it's both because both are actually the same thing. The person who is able to have faith and the person who is able to have kindness on this high level is actually someone who has changed themselves fundamentally and made themselves someone who's not living for themselves alone. And by dint of that, they have a deep, intimate connection with their fellow man and with their creator. We see this by Moshe. The first episode we find out about Moshe. Well, what's Moshe? Moshe is the greatest prophet that ever lives, that has ever lived. It seems to be a relationship between him and God. Yet the very first episode that we see about Moshe is Moshe caring and suffering with his fellow man. Again, you imagine someone who's a man of God to be monastic, to be living by themselves in seclusion. Yet somehow Moshe, who we would maybe perhaps imagine as someone who is totally isolated from his fellow man, just Moshe and God, yet the first thing we find out about him is how he cares and how he feels the pain of others. The answer is because when we look at a human and how a human changes and what the objective of life is, it's actually to change who you are. and. When you change who you are, that automatically results in the relationship you have with others and the relationship you have with God. And thus, and it works all different ways. If someone develops a deep relationship with their creator, necessarily it's going to affect how they treat other people and vice versa. If someone invests in becoming someone who, is, who has kindness, who has chesed, automatically that's opening a door for the relationship with God. Because all that reflects inwardly and changes who the, how they are oriented. You look at the beginning of the Torah, uh, the first introduction of the Yetzir Hara. So they eat from the fruit. The next thing we're told is that they're in the garden and they're naked and they don't notice it. And then right away, once they eat the fruit, they're hiding and cowering behind trees. So this is kind of a strange introduction to a human influenced by the Yetzir Hara. But the answer is, is that what the Yetzir Hara does is it 
changes the entire focus. It, like it obviates God. It puts God kind of in, in it, it. It makes this world and this and this life and a life of 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 division. It makes that the standard. And therefore, what does Abraham? What does Adam do? Adam ducks behind a tree, as if God can't see behind the tree. Right? He, he's taking God and lowering into his standards. And God says, "Well, why'd you eat from the tree?" So he right away he blames God. The woman that you gave me. You're responsible. I'm not responsible. So simultaneously, he's rejecting the fact that the woman did a lot good for him. Like Eve was the best thing that ever happened to him. And he's rejecting God. Automatically, he's now in his little world. He's just, he's righteous. He's justifying whatever he does. And everyone else is guilty. God's guilty. His wife is guilty. Right? Where does that division come from? That's the, that's the, uh, the handiwork. Of the it's a, it's a hurrah, and thus back to Rebecca. What Eliezer was taught to look for is looking for a person, a perfect person, or oh, perfect, but a, per, a person who is pursuing perfection, and you could find that in a variety of ways. But he says, if I find chesed, if I find kindness, where they intuitively, instinctively feel the pain of others without being told, I already know where they're holding with respect to the relationship with God because someone who does that is someone who necessarily already has the path towards or already has the relationship with God already set in stone. And I think this this cut does give us a little bit of an insight uh, into, you know, what our objective is. You know, we talk about Torah. Torah, Talmud tells us, is the antidote for the Yetzirah. Torah is the power that we should change ourselves and that will be manifest in all different kinds of ways. We, we mentioned it a few weeks ago that if someone has Torah but doesn't have kindness, they don't have God. Torah is supposed to bring you both to kindness and to God. So if you have Torah but don't have kindness, obviously you have not used the Torah properly and therefore, by definition, you don't have God. Well, what if someone does believe in God? Yes. But the, to, to actually change yourself and to reorient and reframe how you see the world, that's the power of Torah. But if it's not manifest in kindness, it's obviously not manifest in faith either.